we all set? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna be reviewing uh, the paper multi-scale representation of very large environments in the hippocampus of flying bats. Um, this is a pretty new paper, came out in 2021. So let's jump into it. Okay, so really the big question that this paper is trying to address is basically how do the encoding schemes of place cells uh, differ when an animal is in a large environment versus a small environment? Uh, and I should say, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me as I'm going. So just for a quick overview of place cells, basically they work to represent an animal's uh, position in space. There's many that are found in the hippocampus and basically they tend to increase in firing rate when an animal passes over a specific region called the place field. Uh, and there's a large number of them found in the hippocampus. Of course, there is uh, many more details than what I'm sharing here, but this is just a brief over overview of how they work. Uh, so basically, most studies of place cells have been focused on uh, relatively small environments, like one to two meters in size. Uh, and there's been little research on more realistic environments, meaning the kilometers that animals tend to uh, traverse as they go about their daily activities. There's been a few studies in larger environments, but these environments often have zigzags or can be compartmentalized into smaller environments. So they're effectively just a conglomerate of many small environments. Uh, and so the, this research, which is focused on small environments, is in pretty stark contrast to the actual behavior of animals. Uh, just to provide some examples, rats can navigate more than a kilometer per night, and Egyptian fruit bats will move up to 30 kilometers per night. Um, and so just to kind of motivate why uh, exploring multi-scale representations is of interest. If we imagine a 10 to 20 centimeter uh, field size, then to represent the distances traversed by the Egyptian fruit bat, you would need about uh, 10 to the 13th neurons. The way that they arrive at this number uh, in the paper is basically they say uh, the fruit bat is flying 30 kilometers and it has a width that it flies within of about two kilometers and a height variation of about 0.5 kilometers. So then if you take that volume and see how many of these 10 to 20 centimeter diameter spheres would fit inside, you arrive at this number. So basically uh, using this naive encoding scheme is not uh, really suitable due to physical limitations of the number of neurons. Did they consider any sort of like a <clears throat> SDR type of encoding? I mean, if you had a thousand neurons and 10 are active for any particular place, you know, those thousand neurons would be totally fine for this range. Would that, right. would that, would, would that work with, with assigned places per cell? No, it would mean that it, it, a given place cell might activate in, in a few oh, other yeah. oh, yeah, <coughs> locations, yeah. but it would see, it would look random. And I think yeah. I think they do find stuff like that. But oh, interesting question. Yeah. So if you look at some sort of a, you know, ensemble coding or SDR type coding, you could get by with a much much smaller number. Right. So they mentioned a little bit about like a place cell uh, firing for multiple locations, but for the most part, the assumption is that a place cell fires for a like a single location or a single uh, neighborhood. And what's really being varied is how uh, sort of how wide the neighborhood is. So, I mean, I should say like a given place cell in this example may fire for uh, multiple locations, but the focus of the paper was really on how the, like the field, the size of each location varies. So I think a illustration will, uh, better represent the point I'm trying to make. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that and show a picture explaining yeah, I, what I mean. I just, so basically- just, Before you go on, just to finish that up, I think what Subutai is pointing out that it's not that the place fields have to be the same size, but just the number that came up with was a sort of a naive way of coming up with that number, the 10 to the 13th. It's a very naive way. It's not really looking at any sort of a 
coding scheme or yeah. you know. it doesn't i don't think that negates the, the the emphasis of the paper it just points that that's a, a funky number yeah <laughs> Yeah, I agree because they're basically saying like if you had a unique place cell for each of these yeah. mini volumes within this 30 kilometer region, this that's how they kind of come up with yeah. uh, this number. I guess it, ex with experimental techniques, you're also somewhat limited because you, you really can record, you're really focusing on a small number of neurons at any particular point in time. And, and you can't look at all of the potential place cell, place cell neurons constantly. Well, I bet, you know, I think, but it, now. so you can't really get, it's hard to get at this coding scheme question with experimental technique. Because here, if they're saying, okay, recorded 235 cells from five bats, um, you know, that's less than 50 cells per bat. And maybe at any point in time, they're only looking, I don't know how many they're looking at at that time. But. It's a little and, hard to get at some of these coding questions. And we do know that that place cells fire in multiple locations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially when you get to a larger environment. So I think the default assumption all along was, hey, yeah, place cell, it fires in one location, but it'll actually fire in many locations if the, if the room gets big enough. Um, that, I think that's been the default assumption. So, but obviously they're going to show something else. That still could be true, but they're yeah, going to show yeah. something else here. So I, I didn't know that actually, that a single place cell will fire in multiple locations. Like if that's yeah. the case, like what's really the distinction between a place cell and a grid cell? Is it just the periodic locations yeah. versus irregular locations? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And it's believed, you know, generally that the locations of place cells are going to be somehow driven by some sort of sensory uh, experience and whereas grid cells generally are supposed to be independent of the sensory experience although both those assumptions seem to be kind of questionable and if you have a place cell responding at two places in one environment you put the animal in a different environment uh that cell might no longer fire at two places in that in that new one like there's no there's the relative firing locations are not systematic in any way it's not just that it's not periodic uh, they're not systematic. It's, yeah, it's, it's not tiled in any way or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, just for a quick overview of the setup of the study. So they were using Egyptian fruit bats and uh, there's a sufficient amount of light to be able to basically recognize uh, potential landmarks within this tunnel that's about 200 meters long. Uh, and the tunnel actually has it actually has a curve of about 43 degrees. So it's like one piece is about 140 meters and the other piece is roughly 50 meters. And then they're, they meet at this 43 degree curve basically. And uh, they're recording from a, uh, the dorsal CA1 inside of uh, the hippocampus. And basically the precision that they can achieve is nine centimeters in terms of uh, knowing where the bat is to basically tie that to the spikes that they record. So um, basically, if we can see in these pictures here, this kind of gets to some of the points that you guys were just making. So the uh, if you'll notice, there's red and there's blue. So the blue me is motion in one direction and the red is motion in the other direction. And uh, so basically, one important thing is that roughly this, the field, the place field size and the number of fields for the neuron is roughly uh, the same in both directions, but it's not the same areas. So for instance, if we uh, look in cell two, we see at this point in the forward direction, that's part of the place field, but it's this other area that's uh, part of the place field in the, in the opposite direction. Um, and it's also worth noting that the range of place fields was quite large. I'm, so I'm, make, I'm just make backtrack there a second. Um, you're saying that the place cell doesn't fire in the same location going forward and backwards. Yes. That's the claim that they're making in the paper, but they're saying the, the statistics as in, the number of uh, place fields that the cell has is roughly the same in both directions. Yeah. Well, you know, place fields, if I, if I recall, they, in, in a, 
if, if you put a rat on a, on a linear track, then the forward and backwards directions have different, different codings. But if, they're, if, it's in, if it's just in a room, then, the, then it's the same cell fires regardless of which direction you're going. So, so if I understand this correctly, this is, this is very much equivalent to a rat being on a one, one dimensional track. Uh, so the bat is basically viewing these two different directions as sort of two different environments in some sense. Is that the right interpretation? Yes, I would agree with that. Um, there, there wasn't much motion in the orthogonal direction. It was pretty much just back and forth and very little sideways motion. No, but I'm talking about sideways. I'm just saying that that it, it, on a linear track, a rat will a cell will encode at one location going one direction, and it will not fire at that same location going the other direction. Mm -hmm. But if if there was in a two dimensional space, and the rat is traveling through that spot and backwards through that spot, the same cell fires in both cases. So it's it's almost it's I've always interpreted that as when you're on this linear track, the animal perceives it like almost like a it's 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 not just I'm in a room, I'm on this track, I'm, and it's sort of a different encoding going one way and coming back. But if you're in a room, it's the same encoding no matter which way you're where you are. So this it's not it's not like you're going orthogonal to the track. Um, yeah, I, I guess all I'm saying is it sounds like it's the same, it sounds like it's the same as a rat on a one way track or or a linear track. It's like, Yes, I would agree with that. They train, basically they get the bat to fly back and forth by putting food on both ends of the uh, tunnel. So it's very much just motion in basically a linear track. Um, so basically what they were able to conclude from this is that there's a very wide variety in the size of the place fields. So a single cell would have uh, up to 20 times differences in the size of its place field. So going from about, uh, you know, well <laughs> under a meter to like roughly 15 to 20 meters. So it's quite a large range in the size of the place fields for a given cell. Um, so then it's interesting to consider some of the different explanations for why this may occur. So some possible explanations that the authors uh, propose and then, and then uh, reject is that uh, differences in speed. And so the reason that this doesn't seem like a valid explanation is because the speed of the bats was roughly constant at about eight meters per second throughout the experiment. So that wouldn't really explain uh, this behavior. Another uh, possibility was the differences in the short and long arms of the tunnel. So like the 150 meter section and the roughly 50 meter section. And this also didn't uh, seem to explain the results because the behavior within just a single arm was pretty much the same as when the two arms were analyzed together. Uh, the recording section within CA1 was not a very uh, unusual or unique place to record. And one of the other points, uh, which kind of ties into what you guys were discussing earlier about the distinction between place cells and grid cells was uh, considering the impact of landmarks. So basically, if they look at the, um, the firing rates with respect to where the landmarks are present, I think it was 13 landmarks that they noted within uh, this tunnel. And then you shuffle the landmarks, you don't see any stronger, any change in the, your ability to match the uh, responses to the landmarks. So you're, basically, you're, they're you're kind saying of say, if they change the landmarks in the tunnel, the cells fire at the same locations. Is that is that what that says? No. So they they didn't physically change the landmarks in the tunnel. Basically, they try to fit they in the uh, in code, like in statistics, they try to fit the um, firing patterns to the landmarks using a distribution. And then if they shuffle the order of the landmarks and they try to fit the firing rates to the landmarks, they don't achieve any worse of a fitting. So basically they're arguing that it's the firing patterns are uncorrelated with the landmarks is the claim they're making. But it would have been interesting to actually um, position the landmarks in different ways, like physically do this and see the impact yeah. it would have. So, so I didn't quite understand your explanation, but it sounds like they were trying to, because typically, if you change the landmarks in an environment, 
uh, a rat would perceive the environment differently and it would have different encodings for place cells and grid cells. But you're not, that's not what you're talking about here. You're talking about they did a statistical technique to say, are the changes in the scale of the place cells, uh, they're trying to eliminate that somehow they're related to the landmarks um, and that they're sort of discounted that idea. I think that's what you're saying. Or it sounded like the peak, the peak of the place cell responses is completely uncorrelated to the location of the landmarks. But I, I don't stand it because if it didn't change the landmarks. Uh, oh, I, okay. Uh, all right. So, so a, but a cell is going to respond to the same location regardless, right? It's, it, and they didn't, it's, and they, it's, all right. So maybe, maybe, is this correct to say like, hey, you've got these landmarks and as this, and, and the size of the, or the peak and the, where the cell fired and the size of its, trip to, its field wasn't correlated to how far away is from a landmark? Is that what you're saying? This is just a statistical technique to see if there's correlation with, with these peaks. They're just shuffling the data around and then rerunning a correlation. Yeah, but what are they, I'm trying to understand what they're getting. What are they, what are they trying to prove? Yeah, my guess they're, is it's what you were saying, Jeff, that it's, they're looking at the distance of the peak to each landmark and, yes. then, yeah, and then seeing whether that there's any correlation. And if you, then if you shuffle the locations of the landmarks virtually, it doesn't make any difference to the average distance to each peak. Okay. Like yeah. Yes, that's that's uh, what they were trying to get at. Because if you actually shuffle the landmarks physically, I would expect you to have a completely different mapping. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you get into these other confounds that okay. you were talking about. Uh, it's funny, you know, just reading this, you can just imagine like some of these were questions raised by the reviewers and that they have to. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like that. It's like a list of those, yeah. Yes. Uh, so then they also wanted to assess how the behavior was different in large and small environments. So um, in these small environments, they noted that a much smaller percentage of the neurons that they measured were, um, were active, basically. One thing that I was, as I was reading the paper, I was struggling to understand was why there was such a large difference in the number of neurons that were recorded in the original large environment and this smaller uh, six meter environment. Uh, one other thing um, to note is that the range of the field sizes in the small environment was much smaller than in the 200 meter long track. So. Um, is this for we, the same, is this for the same cells? Like, um... I mean, is it like, it's interesting because, you know, I don't think people have reported these changes in size of the receptor fields before, or at least nothing of this scale. And so the question is like a, a single place cell in small environments always represents sort of a similar size place. But when you put it in a big environment, it, it, it might start representing big places. Is that, is, is that right? I mean, is it the oh. same cell changes from like, hey, I'm in a, if I was, in a small environment, I would be reliably representing uh, places that are, you know, uh, um, 20 centimeters. And then, but I put you in this big environment, that same cell might then start representing, you know, some are meters. And is, that, is that what that says? I don't know if it's the same cell. It sounds like it's different cells, uh, different experiment. Um, yes, these are, these are different bats, I believe. Mm. Yeah. In the, uh, in this yeah. six meter track. So you think they would have done an experiment with the same bats, but who knows, okay. Again, um, I guess there's a reasonable chance this is something they thought of afterwards or uh, that the or maybe the reviewer thought of, uh, suggested uh, and then they, yeah. have to, they do Go it. Go back, yeah. And uh, so to the point about the size of the place fields, basically if we look here, we see the ratio of the largest to the smallest place fields. And we see in the 200 meter environment, the ratio is much higher than in the smaller environment. Um, and now you could argue that this doesn't necessarily, this may just be because there's the size of the place field will only get so small and it can only be so big in the smaller environment, but in the larger environment, this maximum size will be larger. So. Like one, one question, I guess, for me that emerges is, is this increase due to the 
maximum place field size simply increasing in the larger environment? Or is there also a counteracting effect of the minimum place field size decreasing in the smaller environment to represent finer tuned areas? Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, from what the plots you were showing earlier, it looked like you can get really thin peaks even in the large environment. So it may be just the larger ones expanding, but it'd be interesting to know for sure. You're saying that the same cell might have a narrow peak in a large environment. Uh, that you still might have, you still have narrow peaks in the, in the larger environment. Yeah, the first figure that uh, Jack showed had that. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to see, see there, but there's some that are really sharply peaked on the cell too. If I recall, I, I thought they said the same, it's been a while since I read this, but I thought the same cells would sometimes show a narrow peak, sometimes show a broader peak. Um, the same cell in the same, the same tunnel. Yes. Well, that's what they're um, illustrating here. So this is a single cell and here the this peak is a bit wider than this peak. Mm -hmm. So it, it is um, same cell, different field sizes. Mm -hmm. um, so one other uh, point that they raised in the paper is like, and this is something I guess we kind of touched on as we were discussing, is the multi-scale uh, coding something that's learned or something that's innate um, to the bats? So all of the data that I've presented so far was from bats that were captured in the wild. So, so these bats are used to existing in very large environments. Hmm. So it's worth considering how a bat that is raised in a laboratory in captivity will perform when it enters um, a very large environment. So uh, basically, th this is going to this point. So what they found is when they take these laboratory-born bats and place them in the 200 meter long tunnel and let them train for a few weeks, then they basically show the same multi-scale properties as the wild-born bats. Although the wild-born bats did have slightly larger um, place fields. So that, I would- Does that imply that the laboratory-born bats, bats, not brats, bats, if they, if, they, if they didn't train for several weeks and they just did it right away, that, that they wouldn't have shown this, this multi-scale coding? Well, so that was my question because in uh, the bullet here, basically, they tested whether th this point was using um, bats from the wild. So bats mm -hmm. that are used to large environments. And basically, they're saying bats that are used to large environments have this, this multi-scale encoding from day one onwards, although there is more variability on day one and it, the variability kind of decreases, but it's possible that in the laboratory bats, that it's during these first few weeks when they're training that they're adapting to this multi-scale coding. So it's possible that there actually is a difference between the lab and the wild born bats, but that difference disappears during this uh, several weeks of training. Well, it's an interesting question because if, you, if you're trying to understand what mechanisms can lead to this, um, you know, that, that's an important data point to know, you know, because it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, 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 I don't think, unless Marcus knows there anything with SuperDial or anyone else, I don't know. Um, I think this is a very surprising result. So it's trying to understand how it could come about. Well, it, it could also come about because when they're, when they're no longer in confined environment, they're spending some time, I mean, they said they have to be trained. They're probably spending some time orienting to traveling larger distances and then associating that with finding food, whereas the food has always been kind of hand delivered to them. So, you know, yeah. it's it's a confounding factor that, you know, they, they couldn't get the experiment set up for no, a couple. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess when I was saying, how does it happen? I meant like, what are the actual mechanisms for how could, how the place cells are created and they're you know, you know, there's a lot of research in this, and as far as I know, we don't still have good answers to this question in general. But you know, how do place cells create their places? And uh, um, but the idea that there's, that there's these multi scale is really surprising, I think. But I think any again, if you think about it from a coding standpoint, like us, think about like a spatial cooler that's trying to represent its inputs. 
if you're given a very restricted set of inputs, it's going to have very restrict, you know, uh, restricted res responses. And if you take that exact same spatial cooler and train it on a much larger set yeah. of inputs, it's going to get much more diverse and yeah, but, but larger. But, but, and so it could be just you have a fixed set of neurons you're going to use for, as your place cells, and it learns to create that, a code for it. But that doesn't explain why there's such a large variability in the, in the receptive field size to individual cells. I mean, then you think, oh, everything scales up or everything scales down. But why would, oh. you know, why, why would you have some, a single cell that's a very narrow field here and a very wide field there? That doesn't really come out of the sort of spatial pool type mechanism, right? Well, I think one thing that shows is that there, there is not a critical period to develop this capability if they're able to adapt yeah. like this. So that's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm purely thinking it is cool. I'm just trying, I'm just thinking about, oh, what are the, you know, this gets critical to the work we're doing, the work that Marcus is doing is like, how do these representations come about? How are they created? You know, what, how do they represent a map of the space? And um, so this research breaks two assumptions I would have had is that place fields would have had similar receptive field sizes. They could have scaled up and down, like you said, Subutai, but I would expect them to have similar receptive field sizes. It also violates something else I've argued for in the past, which I've argued for that when we're trying to, to read out a location, now this is related to grid cells, but I argued that we shouldn't be, we wouldn't want to look at grid cells of multi, multiple scales because that would be an unreliable uh, SDR. Um, and so maybe no one's reading out all these place cells, but here you are, now you have a set of cells that are responding at different scales. And so you, they're acting, okay, that's, that's your code for your location. But if I wanted to reliably record, you know, pick that location, it'd be hard to do with neurons. I could explain why for those who don't know, but um, so it, it's, it's sort of two odd, odd results that I wouldn't have expected. So it's totally has lack of little much right now. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of my main take of this paper is besides the computational aspect is from the biological aspect, how much of the behavior and computation that we observe is actually born from um, mice and animals being in artificial environments and then how much of that of those com cognitive and and computational uh, uh, computation that we observe and we want to interpret are actually artificially born from from them not being into their uh, ecological environment yeah. yeah so that's something to be aware of and and maybe to think a little bit more about yeah it, that's a good point it really calls into question 95 percent of the <laughs> neuroscience experiments that are done these days um, and they're often these uh, lab mice and lab rats are specific, specifically genetic, have specific genetic things. So you can do the type of recording. Then I, I, one of the, an experimenter once told me that these rats or mice would never actually survive in the wild. They just wouldn't survive even from birth. Uh, no, they're probably just, not. Yeah, but they're just genetically and, and not, uh, they're completely, they're quite engineered and very different from wild animals. So, okay. And even between like different strain of animal of, of lab rare animals, you can see differences in, in spatial ability. For example, C57 mice are really good at spatial stuff. Uh, BL mice are really bad. <laughs> I mean, this is this is a general problem of interpreting any kind of experimental data because yeah. the, you've got the age of the animal, you know, the preparation, you know, in general, we're talking about all different types of empirical experiments. Um, and sometimes if it's, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the different preps of different techniques, they all have their biases, right? They all end up with different results. So now we just have to add another one here. We have to think about all these grid, all the grid cell and place cell experiments have ever been done. They'd be completely all biased because of the size of the environments. It's like, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's completely possible that the mechanisms that we're observing are only a subset of the computation that actually are going on due to that. Um, something to keep in mind, at least, when, yeah. when getting yeah. to those data. I'd say it's not, not a possibility, it's a certainty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought that was one of the most interesting aspects of the paper was how there may just be this, uh, this bias in yeah. so many neuroscience studies. This also tells me, it, it sounds like it's electrophysiology that they did, not calcium recordings. Um, is that they're not optical recordings, right? These are uh, probes that they sent in. Yes, that's correct. 
that may explain why there are such limited numbers of neurons also. Yeah, well, and you asked why, oh. why in one experiment there's 250 and the other is like 50 or something. That could have also been what I said earlier that maybe they said, hey, you need the reviewer said to get some more data on this, on this short uh, tunnel. And they didn't want to go through the whole experiment again, so they figured 50 is enough. <laughs> but that would be my bet. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> also, hypercampal neurons are especially uh, uh, sparse to respond. So you stick an electrode in there, you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to have any response. So maybe they stick a yeah. lot of electrodes and you've got very few responses as possible. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. OK. Uh, and so then to some of the computation type of stuff. So um, they just basically consider the impact of having uh, single scale versus multi-scale coding. Um, so they present a few different schemes. In this one, basically each neuron has um, a single uh, small place field. This one, each neuron has a single large place field. This one, each neuron has a single place field, but the place fields are of different sizes between neurons and increase as you go across the population. In this one, each neuron has, a, has multiple place fields, all of the same size, and the size of the place fields for neuron I and neuron J are the same. In scheme five, each neuron has multiple place fields. The place fields for a given neuron are all of the same sizes but different neurons have different uh, place field sizes. And then in scheme six, it's uh, a hodgepodge of everything, I guess. Each <laughs> neuron has multiple place fields, all of different sizes. So, uh, and basically scheme six is what aligns most with the empirical observations. Uh, so basically they find for small environments, all of the schemes perform roughly equally. And for large environments, the, uh, the multi-scale repre representations perform better. What does perform, um, what does perform mean in this case? So they measure performance basically by, in a few different ways. Uh, one is how many neurons do you need to accurately uh, keep track of the, the position in the simulation? And they define accuracy as being less than two meters from the actual position. And then also just kind of the, the average of the error in terms of from the ground truth position. Uh, as, and both of these are as a function of the size of the environment. So we, we can see that for uh, quite large environments here, the, the number of neurons needed especially for the, the two multi-scale um, schemes, really doesn't increase too much, where the, the other schemes, it's a, a quite substantial increase. Um, one way that they try to explain this is through uh, from an energy considerations perspective. So they consider the amount of ATP that's needed to generate a spike uh, of a neuron and basically, they're arguing that the reason that the, the single scale encoding maybe is, is more of what's observed in small environments is because uh, it may take less, it, it takes less energy, basically. But as you get into larger environments, this energy benefit of using single scale encoding goes down, and the accuracy of using the multi scale encoding uh, becomes much more significant compared to the single scale coding. Uh, so then we kind of touched on this earlier, but so basically it kind of, this paper kind of begs the question, is it that multi-scale encoding is the underlying representation and in a small environment, it's just a small aspect of this that is, that is seen? Uh, or is it that the neurons are actually switching when they get into the larger environment to use multi-scale encoding. And uh, the authors seem to, prefer, to seem to prefer the second approach that the neurons are switching from single scale uh, encodings to multi-scale because they argue if it were multi-scale encodings, then in the small 
environments, you would see some neurons that are just always on because their place field would encompass the entire uh, length of the small environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know that that was a point that I was kind of I was I'm curious what everyone thinks if if you think that that necessarily rules out the possibility that the multi scale representation is the the underlying encoding structure. Or just... so the, the, the thing about the, the cells would be firing continuously. I don't know about in the hippocampus, but I know in the cortex, you, you find cells that seem to fire continuously for at least for a long period of time. Um, so, but I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that they're suggesting you don't find those in the hippocampus. So I don't know if anyone knows. Yes, they're arguing that in what they observed, they did not see cells that were just firing uh, continuously the whole time. In the small environments. But you said they favored the second one, or that would be true. So I'm, I don't understand. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, the the um, disputed the second one on the grounds that they would expect to see neurons. Oh, they disputed it. Okay. Time. Yes, okay. I misspoke before. Sorry. Um, yeah, so that's an overview of the paper. I have a couple more slides that go into a little more detail on a few things if anyone has any questions or anything. That was a really clear presentation, Doc. That was nice. Yeah, it was really nice. Thank you. Marcus, you there? Yeah. How, how do you think this impacts the stuff you're working on? What do you, is it, is it, are you I mean, so I, I would say that I've never had like a compelling theory of place cells. Uh, I mean, the one answer would be, I, I mean, right now I'm looking at them through the lens of being graph nodes. And, um, and so it could be the case that it, as a, as a bat is flying through like a long tunnel, it has these memory graph nodes associated with different parts of it. And um, the way that those nodes are allocated is what we would call an SDR. You just have some random code, a, a random code, and sometimes these are going to be associated with like far off landmarks that can be seen for a, a while. Other times they're going to be associated with like quick things that are seen in passing. And so one point of view would be that you just have this general, uh, this general neural mechanism for representing nodes and you associate things with them. And sometimes you associate things that you see for long scales and sometimes you associate things you see for small scales. That's one way you could approach this, yeah. but I'm not even pushing this very hard because that. Well, I don't know if that's you're what place cells we, are. We haven't really thought about place cells too much is what you're saying. It's not really part of the overall theories we have. Is that would that be a correct assessment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we we haven't we we've made, we've suggested things along yeah. the way, but yeah. it's not it's not been our main focus ever. You know, did they? You know, it's interesting to see whether the, this kind of multi scaling would occur in grid cells. Uh, did the paper talk about that at all? So, I mean, I can jump in. Just this group has recorded lots of grid cells, and I think they're saving that for a future paper. Oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that would that would be the thing that would really mess me up, right? You know, because we you know there's all the proposed mechanisms for path integration and and for the precession of activity, you know, you know all this stuff, and that I think would have to make me rethink everything I thought about grid cells, at least a good portion of it. If, if they so the 3D as well, right? The, the bats. Yeah. Yeah, so so I have seen um, Olenowski speak on on this and um, on three three D grid cells, and um, they came to the conclusion that they're um, that the that the cells distance the fields um, have the same re like rough distance apart from each other. Uh, so uh, the same rough distance, although I should mention it's not very regular. It's not a nice clean three D lattice, but it is three D. Uh, but the point is, if they're e roughly evenly spaced, if the average distance between them is roughly the same, you would expect their scale, the size of the fields is probably also roughly the same yeah. if they're equally spaced. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, that's good. Nice. I don't know if anyone else has questions. All right. I, I feel like part of the, this paper is like um, the fact that we describe these cartoonish place cells, like these cells that just represent locations, it has like I th almost nobody believes that's what place cells are. That's just a way to think about them. And I, and I feel like um, I feel like that cartoonish initial definition is, has led to now these. I, I, I think that the way um, Subutai characterized this as like having a population code, sort of like how we'd use SDRs, um, is, is a more accurate way of thinking about place cells. And uh, go on. Yeah, but I've always felt that was the case because we do know that place cells fire in multiple locations. And it was just, it just was obvious to me. I always felt like, hey, as, as environments get larger, they're going to have to fire more and more. And, you, and so it's going to be some SDR encoding. So I think the new thing for me is the change of the scale of a single cell. That, not, and I, I think you're right too, Marcus. You're not, we never really thought too much about place cells. That we think a lot about grid cells. Um, but it's still surprising, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> just it, it doesn't it doesn't throw anything out the window yet. It just says, oh, well, like that's another data point. Didn't know about that one. You know. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, I want to be mindful of time. So if anyone, if no one has any more questions, then I'll uh, hand it off to Ben. Uh, or if anyone has a couple more questions, we can continue. Yeah, we should probably move on. Uh, maybe you can cede your time to Ben. <laughs> yes, of course. It's already 11. But yeah, thanks. This was really clear. I was, uh, given that you haven't really done much reading in neuroscience at all, that was really great, Jack. Yeah. Oh, these are thank complex, you. These are complex papers to go through. Um, yeah, it's it quite dense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I second that. Thank you. All right, uh, cool. Representational drift time. Um, yeah, so uh, this paper has, oh, hang on, let me hide the Zoom thing. We don't see it. <laughs> yeah. It's just your, Wait, something that says no backups for 76 days. That is not quite true. I do have Google backups going, <laughs> but <laughs> I understand the concern. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, this paper has a lot of data in it, and it's going to take a while to explain the data. So I wanted to set the big picture uh, up front um, to kind of anchor us. Um, so first off, in the introduction, they cite a whole bunch of references saying that in other sensory modalities like touch and vision and audition, um, sensory representations seem to be pretty stable over a long time period. Um, so this idea that there's drift in sensory representations, especially in the olfactory cortex, uh, is kind of the exception, not the rule. Oh, that's a big deal. I didn't catch that just glancing at the paper. Okay, interesting. Okay, go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I thought that was an important piece of context. It is. Um, another, you know, big picture thing to understand is just the processing of olfaction in the brain. So um, in the nasal epithelium, there are these uh, cells that have receptors that bind to specific um, volatile molecules. And then these cells project to the glomerulus and this coupling seems to be very precise. So cells that express a particular odor receptor seem to couple specifically um, to particular glomeruli, if I'm saying that right. And by contrast, the coupling from the glomerulus to the piriform cortex, which they study here, does not have any apparent structure, they say. Um, people kind of talk about it as being random, or at least if there is structure, we don't understand it or know what it is. And the activation. And this okay. latter one, I think, is very sparse and high dimensional. Is that right? Uh, from from glomerulus to piriform? I thought so, yeah. Or maybe it's the other one. I, I, I don't remember exactly which one. But one of them is really sparse and very high dimensional. OK, never mind. You, I, you, I, you, I don't know. I, I thought coupling from, from here to here was supposed to be pretty sparse. Um, OK, maybe that's like, the one. 
yeah, like only only couples to like one or two of the you know possible eighteen hundred of these glomeruli, which I'm, I honestly don't even know exactly what they are, but um, there are lots of them in a mouse's brain and fewer of them in our brains, I think. Glomeruli basically um, target of the same type of autoreceptors. So all the same type of other receptors are going to bind the same uh, other molecule, basically converge onto the same glomeruli. Uh, I think there's a hundred times convergence ratio or something like that. Okay. Um, so the other thing that they point out is that um, according to other researchers, um, the activation patterns that you see in the glomerulus also appear to be stable over time. Um, so this paper studied the piriform cortex. So the question is basically what's going on in the piriform cortex and, um, you know, why is that different? Um, like I said, there's going to be a lot of data, but like basically the one finding that they beat to death in this paper is that if you look at single neurons responses to different odors, uh, within the same day, they're pretty similar, um, but they drift over time. So the experimental setup is that they have this very permanent probe that they stick into a mouse's skull and a uh, question, no? So I guess in other experiments, it's kind of just floating here, but here they cement it into the skull to try and keep it from moving. Um, they're targeting layer two, three pyramidal neurons in the piriform cortex. They make a note that they might be hitting inhibitory neurons sometimes, but they're mainly targeting these layer two, three neurons. Um, some controls and discussion of the spike sorting algorithms they use. So they're trying to, I guess, map individual spikes to individual neurons. And what they find is that, uh, or what they're able to gather is um, isolating about 105 single neurons per recording session, you know, plus or minus. Uh, if you look down here in the these panels B and C, the number of units recorded does decrease over time, but it's not very pronounced. So, I mean, I think it's pretty impressive that they can record from um, so many neurons so stably over time. Um, one possible confound for spike sorting is that individual neuron waveforms can shift over time and start to look different. They make a note that, uh, from what they can tell, a single neuron's waveform doesn't really change over time in this experiment, and um, that gives them a little bit more confidence in the results. So the waveform is a bit like uh, the neuron's footprint, and so it stays kind of the same over time. And if you look at the next most similar waveform for a single neuron, so you look at, you know, neuron A's spikes and neuron B's spikes, you know, the next most similar has only a correlation of like 0.3, so it's a really big difference. They don't go into depth on how they do this, at least not in the main text, but um, I guess they try and estimate the position of the neurons relative to the probe as well, and they claim that that's stable over time. So this is just kind of describing the experimental setup and some confounds that they try and roll out. At the end of the day, what that gives you is about 379 individual neurons that they can track stably over 32 days in six mice. This would seem to be the... the the largest concern for this result, right? Is that they say it's relatively stable, these representations for over a day, but it drifts over time. And of course the neural tissue is also moving around and drifting and things are growing. And, and so, and you know, and so one could easily argue that, um, that the change is not because they're not recording from the same cells anymore, right? <laughs> that would be the most, so I guess they had to go through a lot of work to try to prove that that wasn't the case. Um, but that would be the most, seems to be the most likely, um, you know, objection one might have to these results, I guess, would be to say, hey, you're not really recording from the same neurons, <laughs> you know. They're, 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 so I, I don't know how to judge the accuracy of their techniques here, right? I guess they, they, they're making the argument they did everything necessary to guarantee they're looking at the same units over 32 days. Yeah, I wonder how they do that. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, it's the cortex, the piriform cortex itself is moving around relative to the probe. Yeah. And I remember, I remember there was a, a talk I heard once where someone was showing when you stick these probes in, 
And um, the, the, the geometry of the probes, the actual tips of the, the probes were, caused the, the cells to change their morphology. That like, um, you know, cause the cells have these membranes and they, this, this, this research showed that if you have a sharp point, the cell membranes could wrap around the tip of the probe and they would literally, they would literally react to the probe as it was some sort of physical thing that they were, they were growing around and, and moving relative to. So it's very hard to imagine you stick this probe in there and these cells are just not moving in static over 32 days. So, but, but I see what you said there, they're, they, they're trying to characterize each individual cell. So they're making sure that they're talking to the same cell. Yeah, that's pretty, I don't know. I don't know enough to, to judge the validity of that. But. Yeah, I mean, they, they go to pretty great lengths multiple times to try and suggest that they've, you know, covered their bases. But yeah, yeah. It, maybe if someone, you know, here has more experience with experimental stuff, they could weigh in on it. But that's a, about all I can say is that they, they did their best to cover their bases. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they, uh, they do this odor test every eight days. So, um, it's kind of confusing. There's, uh, <laughs> there are eight odors that they administer to the mouse and they administer every eight days. And on a day where they administer these odors, they do it seven times throughout the day. Um, and, uh, in figure G here, what you're looking at are raster grams for a single um, neuron. So the x-axis is time. Uh, a dot means that the neuron fired a spike. And uh, you're looking at each color here is um, one of the seven trials. So, or sorry, you've got like seven trials here within a single color. And then different colors are different days. And in the two um, rasters that I, uh, put boxes around, you can see that the kind of firing rate activity of a neuron in response to an odor is changing over time. So on day zero, this neuron's not firing very much when uh, it's given this odor, but by the end, uh, by day 32, it's firing a lot. You've got the opposite here for this other neuron in response to neural. It's firing a lot at first and not so much later. I wonder if there could be another effect too. It's these odors might not be naturalistic odors that they sniff uh, regularly. So maybe it's just a learning thing that over the course of several days, they they learn to represent these odors. It's not that their representation is changing. It's just that they've never smelled these odors before. So now they're learning to form representations of that. Or just habituation, even if it's yeah, natural. Just, exactly, yeah. You know, it's just like, hey, I'm tired of smelling this thing. It's not interesting anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they so they, they talk a little bit about this later in the paper. I think the habituation thing possibly makes sense because in a later experiment, they uh, look at basically how frequency of exposure to the odor affects drift. And yeah, drift is uh, it's supposed to be slower if you're just frequently exposed to it. So if you just expose the animal every single day, you know, it cuts the drift rate in about half. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't read the paper, so I don't know which other they're using, but you can, if you do immediate early gene uh, activity mapping over, I think, days with the same others, you see a decrease in, in their um, activity activation. So that would be somewhat similar. Yeah. And did they say, what, do you know if the animals were exposed to these odors before the experiment started at all? Are these completely um, I don't know if they mentioned that. They, so I don't know if, if these specific odors were familiar or not before the experiment, but they do test that in a later experiment with okay. different odors. Um, do they associate any of these odors with like uh, food delivery or anything like that? So they're incentivized to kind of memorize them or, or you know, like they said, it can just be, I'm ignoring this thing because it's not producing anything of interest to me. Not yet. They do an experiment later where they give the animal foot shocks in response to a specific odor. Oh, shocks. Okay. Yeah, they, they didn't like cheaper. the reward thing. They, you know, <laughs> they wanted this to be dark and brutal. So, um, <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> okay, so this slide, um, I probably should have broken this up into like lots of chunks, but um, there's a lot of data on this slide. The, the takeaways are simple. It's just that individual neuron firing rates are similar within a day and they change over time. Um, I'm gonna walk through each of these panels. I'll try and kind of move quickly to cover ground. So uh, figure A, we've got 300 some neuron odor pairs. So you've got a single odor and uh, you're looking at the firing rates um, of neurons. Now different neurons can have uh, just different firing rate statistics. So some just fire more than others. So they z-score them to put them all on the same kind of scale and they sort them based on rate on day zero. Um, so up here are the neurons that fire fastest in response to this odor. Down here are the ones that actually fire less than normal in response to this odor. And if you apply this ordering um, on each of the subsequent days where the rats or rather the mice uh, smell these odors, you can see that the ones that used to respond a lot to this odor are kind of changing and not really as responsive later on. And meanwhile, the ones that used to you know, be anti-correlated with this odor, uh, you know, this pattern just sort of washes out. So this just demonstrates that there's some drift going on. The right panel is just the opposite version of it. So they sorted based on activity on day 32. Okay. Um, they look at the raster grams, use that as features to train a support vector machine with a linear kernel. So they look at the accuracy of a linear classifier to, and it's, this is eight ways classification. So there are eight orders that you're trying to determine based on the raster grams. And if you train it on data from day zero and test it on data from day zero, um, you get decent accuracy, and then that accuracy decays monotonically with time. So it's not like, um, you know, the um, the representation shifts a little bit and then stays static. It looks like it pretty much just keeps shifting and uh, goes almost all the way to chance. Okay, um, going to panel B, we're looking at um, odor neuron pairs on day zero. And these are even trials versus odd trials. Um, and uh, basically the firing rates of neurons are very well correlated within a single day. Um, so the correlation here is like, you know, it's really high. As we go to the right, we're just doing the same thing, but now we're comparing data on day zero with day eight, 16, 24, 32. The blue line is the regression line, and you can see at a glance that the blue line is getting flatter as you go to the right. So, um, and I think this could easily, this could really be explained as the animals just learning to represent these odors. It's the, that first takeaway of responses to odors are similar within a day but change over time. That's true for almost anything that involves LTP or long-term plasticity. And there's all sorts of consolidation and stuff that happens overnight and, and anything that involves long-term learning, you would get that statement. Of, you know, that, that statement would be applicable to it. So maybe maybe the, the following experiment that you mentioned earlier would, would help clarify that, but this seems like a learning phenomenon to me. Yeah, I mean, I could kind of jump to that. The, the remaining four figures on this slide have the same takeaway. Um, yeah. It's, it's worth noting, okay, so they, they, they looked at the population, not just single neurons. So you have 300 cells, you have a 300 something vector, you look at the firing rate of all the cells, you average over the seven trials on a day and you get this population vector. And now you look at the cross correlation of that vector with population vectors on days eight, 16 and so on. And so obviously the kind of overall population um, kind of activity that you see is uh, <laughs> it's a lot of words. The, the correlation in those population vectors is decaying pretty much exponentially in time. Um, this slide is more or less just doing some, oh, well, there are a couple things. First, they do, they do some controls. So they look at how individual neuron firing rates overall change with time. And uh, there doesn't seem to be very much change. They look at the population 
sparseness. So what fraction of neurons are on at any given time? It also doesn't seem to change very much over the course of these 32 days. Um, yeah, I kind of forget which all things they looked at, but the point is that they did a series of controls and there wasn't very much change. These uh, principal component plots are just um, every day that they administer odors, they calculate principal components and then they plot the odor on the first two PCs. The point that they're trying to make is that there's not really any obvious clustering. Oh, and one other thing I should mention is um, they did choose these odors to be kind of as different as possible. So they were trying to get a very diverse array of odors. Um for the for the pc mapping did they use the first um pcs of the first day to map the other days or did they recalculate the pcs if each day the the axes like the they recalculate day? each day okay um so now this experiment is uh, a bit more interesting let me find zoom thing away. Okay, so um, they uh, they take two new odors, and they uh, every time the animal smells one of these things, they shock the the mouse on the foot. Um, then they do a behavioral assay to verify that. Um, when the animal smells this, they uh, try and run away. So the animal is indeed uh, learned to be afraid of this smell, the CS plus smell. Um, I think ingress is like, I don't know, maybe, maybe if someone knows experimental neuroscience better, they can say, but I think this is like the animal moving backwards or something, trying to get away. Anyway, um, this is stable over a period of about 16 days and um, they're plotting the same thing for other odors below. So the animal is afraid of this one odor. It's not really afraid of the other odors is the idea. Um, and now you look at the uh, rate of drift. Um, so I kind of glossed over it, but they, they compute, they fit an exponential decay model to the um, angle between population vectors. And you basically have similar drift rates, even if you're um, shocking the animal. So I'll pause briefly to reconsider, Subuta, your idea that learning could just explain this. Because here the animal is learning to associate the smell with you know, a negative reinforcement, and the drift rate is the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you mean the same as in the previous experiment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And drift rate did not change between familiarization phase and test phase, right? Um, are you, it depends on if you're talking about figure E here. What can you uh, I'm just say again? D and E. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe you're not here then. Oh, so sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I was. Uh, I was talking only up to figure C right okay, now. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so now jumping to figure D, um, they try um, administering familiar odors and they administer every single day. So um, I guess what they do is there's a familiarization, familiarization phase where for 16 days they have the animals smell the scent and um, Yeah, what's the idea? The idea is just that um, if you look at the drift rate, it's going to be a lot lower for this scent that they're being exposed to every single day. On the other hand, if you spend 16 days familiarizing the animal with the scent, and then you only administer the scent every eight or, uh, or so days after that, the drift rate is no different than you know what you would expect from any of the odor other odors that they've seen so far. Wait, I, I didn't quite catch that difference. I'm sorry. Um, sure. What, what's the um, difference between the blue and the gray? Experiment? Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. So if you look at unfamiliar odors, uh, odors that the animal has not seen before, and yeah. you just start measuring responses, 
it uh, the responses drift over time. Yeah, the so rate that, of drift is expect if it's learning. That that's what you would expect if it's learning those orders, right? And yeah, that that is what I would expect. Yeah. So now, the rate of drift is the same still, though. If you spend 16 days familiarizing with the odor, and then you look at drift over the following 16 days, where you only have the animal smell every every eight days, so that's um, I'm I'm looking at this figure here. So this blue uh, dotted line is a familiar odor sampled, you know, infrequently, and the rate of drift is just the same as um, an unfamiliar odor. Okay, but but if you familiarize, if you're on the above one, on the one above, if you are if you familiarize yourself with an odor and you're exposed to it constantly, then the drift is very low. Yeah, and that's the only. Well, it's it's not even that low. It's about half as much, so it's still drifting considerably. But this is the only thing that they were able to do to slow yeah. the drift is just okay. expose the animal to it continuously. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so that argues maybe it's a little bit, it's not just explained by learning a new thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it could be more like habituation, like Jeff was saying. I kind of have to think about it. I mean, I think this panel here, like this experiment argues against the learning idea. Yeah. I'm not sure about habituation. I need to think about it. Not sure either. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the key question I'm trying to think through here, and maybe it's in your conclusion slide too, the next one. Um, you know, the word drift has all these connotations with it. You know, there and in the press articles, it's and, and stuff around this paper. The question was, you know, how, how could we possibly learn anything if the underlying representation is constantly changing? That's what kind of the word drift connotates. Versus if it's plasticity or habituation, it's not really that it's constantly changing. It's just that you're either learning to code it and then it's fine, or habituation is just a normal thing that we're kind of used to. You know, the representation go away and then come back again if it's infrequent. I mean, this seems to be a it seems like they're arguing that it's really constantly drifting. Like if you were to measure this for years, like you'd never get a stable representation of these orders, which seems kind of bizarre. Right, I mean, I guess that, that would be another thing that you'd predict if it's learning these smells is you would predict that they would stabilize at some point. Yeah, exactly. But, but if it's constantly drifting, that's a whole different thing. So are they claiming that they never stabilize? They just say it just keeps going. I think that's what they're trying to yeah. play here. You can slow it down. You, know, you can slow it down a little bit, but not much. You know, the thing about this to me is like the piriform cortex is such an unusual thing. I mean, it's not, it's just different than other neural tissue. And, and so if, if this phenomena is really just isolated to the piriform cortex, then it's it's still interesting and but it's not like a more fundamental ground shaking observation to me so did did they talk about further about whether this kind of drift would be seen elsewhere you start in the very beginning they said did they say they tried to find this in other other sensory modalities or they just said they didn't look or they said other people have shown it to be stable or they talked about what other people did so they didn't look in this paper um, they cite a bunch of papers saying that sensory representations are more stable in other modalities. Uh -huh. And uh, okay. uh, in the discussion, they note uh, a handful of references, maybe only five references in total, uh, that there's been representational drift observed in other areas. Uh, the majority of references pertain to area CA1 in the hippocampus. One of the references talks about drift in the posterior parietal cortex. So I'm, I'm looking at your second line there. So it can kind of imply that the piriform cortex oh. is, or complex is, is actually uh, coding for novelty as opposed to identification per se. 
So I, it. Go, go ahead, Kevin. No, I, that, that, that that was that was that was the extent of it because we're when we're saying you know it could be a learning thing. The question is, what is actually being learned? Um, is it identification or is it this is different than what I've you know currently noted and I should pay attention to it for X Y Z reason or not? Um, I, I, I apologize that this is confusing, but actually the, the first three lines here are possible explanations that they list in the discussion section. Okay. Um, well, so it's interesting. It's, interesting. it's like, it, it, you know, the hippocampus, of course, is also known as a fast learning system. And um, it's, it's one of the first places people observed um, new neurons being created all the time. So there's, there's a general you know, belief that the neural population is turning over there um, more rapidly than other parts of the brain. If you think of it like a temporary working space, then, then that kind of makes sense. So, so I guess his first point is that maybe the peripheral cortex is doing something similar. And um, and you know maybe they're you know it's even possible. But the, well, they're they're measuring from the same neuron, so that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Take that back. I was thinking like, oh, you can have a turnover of the system. You know, the neurons are replacing each other. And as um, far as I know, that's not been shown in peripheral cortex. Oh, okay. Well, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but no, no, that, know, yeah, it's and, not been anyway, shown. Well, also, if there if there really are measuring from the same neurons the whole thirty two days, then that wouldn't explain it. Then. Does it explain which, uh, which part of the um, peripheral cortex they're recording to from? I don't recall any details about that. Okay. I can follow up after. Like, sounds, ben, sounds like you know something about this. So what, what are the different parts of the peripheral cortex? I, I have no idea. You mean Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy. I'm sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Uh, yes. I'm not completely familiar with everything, but I know that some uh, part of the olfactory bulb uh, project preferentially in some subspot of the uh, peripheral cortex. So, for example, other valence, uh, if you like an order, if you don't like it, have some preference in where it's um, projecting onto the peripheral cortex, which seems to have some link with reward system, for example. Um, but I'm not uh, a specialist of the peripheral cortex itself. So, um, I can yeah. find some papers we can discuss. No, more I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, another really, is it true that it's like right next to the hippocampus? It doesn't, isn't it like physically right next to it or something? That's, that's, that's what I had heard. And I think there was like kind of, I don't know how much evidence there is for this, but there was like the idea I've heard before that smells are supposed to be more evocative of memories than other senses. And the explanation yes. had to do with it being close to the hippocampus. Hmm. Um, I've not heard that, but maybe. Oh. All right. So, ah, interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess I was much more bothered by this paper when I thought they were going to make a broader argument that representations throughout sensory modalities are going to be changing rapidly. Um, and if it's really just the olfactory system, well, then the hell that's a screw system to begin with so <laughs> well it, it doesn't it, our theories don't involve it too much you know you don't have good representation of the olfactory system in the cortex it's less of a sensory motor system um you know there's a lot yeah. of weird things about it it's a different that makes it interesting though well it makes it interesting but if we're trying to get to the core of what you know representations for the world are in your head and, and not, you know intelligence and building intelligent machines if the olfactory system works on other principles, well, I think we can let someone else figure those out because <laughs> I think we can go forward. You know, our, AI, our AIs don't smell, so there you go. <laughs> Yet. Does, yeah. <laughs> does anyone know about um, these references? I didn't read these references about uh, a representational drift in the hippocampus. Like I, if there's anything relevant to, to what we're doing here, I would think it'd be that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just saw that there's a, there's a lot more turnover of the neurons in the hippocampus. So, um, and, and so that's, I, I, I'm not familiar with any other research along those lines. Yeah, 
know, so if it's if it's can be thought of as some sort of temporary working memory, you wouldn't expect the same neurons to be around, you know, activated yeah. times. It's another yeah. possibility. Well, you can yeah. think of you know you can think of it like um, there's this general theme about uh, memories being formed quickly in the hippocampus and and um, more long term in the cortex, and so uh, you know it makes it makes you wonder if there's something else like that's going on here that um, the representation coming out of the out of the piriform cortex could be changing, but there's some sort of short term memory, but maybe there's in other places that reading out a more permanent memory. I, I mean, I don't know where else those glomeri project to. I don't know if they project to anywhere else, I don't know. Um, okay, well, that was good. I, I think I think it's something that's just up to watch, you know, if we really found this as a predominant thing going on in the brain all around that representations are not stable, that would be a pretty big challenging problem to deal with. <laughs> Them, them well, on. actually, I'm a little curious. I mean, um, I don't. Know. Do, do do you see that as being like a big problem? Uh, well, I think our representations of the world are pretty stable, right? I mean, I can remember things uh, from long from long times ago, and and we have to be able to recall them and interact. With, you know, all my memories about the world have to be able to interact properly with one another. So. If representations change dramatically over time, I, I don't know how that how, how any of that sort of coordination would work. It seems really hard. Yeah, I, I guess the so... yeah, go ahead, Ben. I guess the the question I would have is, um, do those have to be at odds with one another? Like, is it possible that you know the the population encoding for different things is drifting over time? but that doesn't preclude stable recall of things. Like well, if it was drifting, then you'd have to have, everything would be drifting, right? And all memories would have to be formed over and over and over again. And it would be like, everybody's learning all the time. <laughs> it's like, um, I mean, it's possible. Uh, it just would be, it would just be a pretty big surprise, I guess, <laughs> to me at least. <laughs> Is there another candidate besides the piriform complex where uh, olfactory memories could reside? Yeah, they, they list four or five places in a single sentence in the discussion saying that, well, maybe olfactory identities don't actually live in the piriform cortex. They live in these other areas. Hmm. Okay, so it could be just a processing nexus. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. That was really clear as well. Two yeah, that was good. Today. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> That's great. Very nice job. Yeah. What was Thank the other you. thing we wanted to talk about today? Was I, I think Ben mentioned that uh, he and Vivian had some questions about oh, yeah. the paper. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like, I'll, but the, the drift thing is kind of a nice segue into that, because I guess what I'm wondering is, like, the way I think of uh, how columns work right now is that um, neurons that are receiving input are um, undergoing a, uh, a learning process or like a plasticity process that tries to minimize the surprise for the kind of inputs they receive. Um, first off, maybe someone check me on that if that's even a reasonable interpretation because everything else falls apart if not. I, that's, you know, uh, that's sort of the predictive coding idea, right? Right. Um, and that's, that's never how I thought about it. Um, I mean, it's not about uh, minimizing surprise, it, I, but you could argue that making an accurate prediction is in some sense minimizing surprise, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's um, you know, in, in the predictive coding ideas, you're trying to like, you know, you only pass on surprises, like you've said, so you, you, the things that are, that are unexpected, you pass them on to the next region or whatever. And, and that's not at all what the columns or, or theories are about. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to only pass on surprises. You're, you're just trying to, all, at all times, you're trying to predict your input. And if something is un, unpredicted or uh, surprising, then that draws your attention to it and you revise your model. 
So uh, just on the very surface of that one sentence, I wouldn't agree with it, but, uh, but then maybe you have thinking about it deeper. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the, I guess minimizing surprises, it is not quite right, but definitely predicting your inputs. Uh, yeah. All right. Which is not the same as minimizing surprises. It's, you're right. You're right. It's not. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we're trying to predict our inputs. That is, that is correct. Um, Right. And so I just wonder if representational drift, you know, is kind of possible here where like, I don't know, um, if there's like, if you start with the premise that there's drift, and then you imagine like the types of in lateral inputs that layer two, three neurons are going to be getting, and then the feedback those are giving to input neurons, um, you can imagine like if there's drift, uh, elsewhere in the brain, then like in a single column, the layer four neurons that are getting inputs and current feedback are also going to drift. Um, so it seems plausible that it's self-consistent to me. Well, just, just to be clear, just to make sure we're not talking about different things, the layer two, three neurons they were talking about in that paper are not the same ones in the cortex. I assume those are piriform cortex. Yeah, that's right. So I'm kind of doing a thought experiment here. Yeah, Suppose so. that we're we're elsewhere in the cortex. In the neocortex? In, in the, the neocortex. neocortex. Okay. Okay. And, Suppose and, we're and, and what is drifting? Your inputs or your like your sensory inputs? Um, like suppose that for uh, a bunch of columns, the layer two, three sparse representation that encodes, you know, a certain thing. Okay. So like the voting neurons we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Suppose the sparse representation that maps to, you know, your water bottle or something is shifting over time. Yeah, so if well you then, yeah, but then the voting would stop working, right? I mean, you'd have to constantly adjust your voting memory, right? The, the, just, I'm, just, I'm just jumping ahead here, I'm sorry. But That's fine, if it you're, may if just take me a second. Yeah, if, if the thing, you know, the, the way this might work, let's say you and I are two columns looking at the water bottle and mm -hmm. I say, okay, I know what this thing is. And you say, you know what this thing is. And we could, okay, at the same time, we agree that something that we're seeing is the same, then we would make an associative connections between uh, our representations of that. So, you, you know, there's no meaning in what my neurons mean to you. You're just saying it's the same thing that I'm looking at now. So I'll just, I'll just associate your pattern with my pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, now if your pattern changes, I can't associate it anymore. I would know, like, it's like, so now later I just see the water bottle and you don't. But my, but, but and if, I, if I didn't have drift, I can invoke the water bottle in your column. I can say, you know, I'm seeing a water bottle. You're probably seeing one too. And you go, well, given everything I know, I'm going to assume there's a water bottle here. But if my representation changes, then you have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> Be like, oh, I don't know, but this is a strange pattern. So the voting wouldn't work um, if somebody's representation changed or if everyone's changed. Okay, so either either the voting would break, or you'd have to continuously be learning how to. Or vote continuously properly. learning, yeah. I mean, any associative memory is going to have that property, right? Any associative memory, once you form the memory, you assume that the two populations you're associating with each other are stable, and if not, then you're right. Then you'd have to continually learn. You'd have to say, you know, yesterday we all knew this was the water bottle, but today we're going to learn it again. <laughs> you know, so, um, which could it could happen? I wouldn't say that's out of the out of the question, it's just certainly wouldn't the way I'd go about designing a system. So, but, but it could be true. I think there okay. would be one problem with those kind of drifting thing would be, you know, things that you haven't seen in a long time. Um, you know, when you re-invoke them, it better be the same because these you're you haven't been continuously learning them, uh, these associations. Or you know, some some columns are sensing it, some other columns far away I haven't sensed it yet for a while. Um, you know, one part of it drifts and the other part doesn't. It'd be really hard to learn. Keep now, the, the one, the one counter example, and maybe someone else knows this literature better than I do. Um, but there's, there's a whole bunch of papers that came out some few years ago about hey, when you retrieve a memory, um, it actually erases it and writes it again. I, I don't even remember the details of this at all, but it was like the idea that that reading is a destructive process in some part of the brain. I don't know which part of the brain it was. I don't remember any details, but it was like, hey, when you're recalling this particular memory, it destroys the memory and then has to be write 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 it out again. And so people were using this as sort of a, a way of getting doing some behavioral therapy because they because they you know you could try and get people rid of their phobias or something like that. You could 
Yeah, yeah she's man. got PTSD. Yeah. So, I mean, so if, what if that were true everywhere in the brain? I have no idea. I'm just totally making this up. What if that were true everywhere? And you say, every time you read anything out, it, it has to form new synapses. It seems impossible, but what if that were true? Then I guess you would be continually learning all the time. So I don't know, it would maybe get around the drift issue, but that seems really, really, I, I, do you remember uh, was it you said that, Jeremy? I don't. I didn't. Who, who said that? But um, where was yeah, that? Occur, I, where was that occurring in the brain? Do you know? I don't remember the specifics of the paper. I would need to yeah. go look it up again. But basically, recalling the memory makes it labile again in the sense that uh, you can re-encode it, and it recruits some of the same protein that we used to encode it the, same, the first time. Um, anyway, so I think so. You're talking. You can the, modify. It's how false memory emerge. Basically, you can modify your memory when you recall it. And that's why um, for integration, you need to ask, need to not prime so a person you integrate, interrogating with some false memory that you want to implant. Yeah. Because when they recall something, then you can modify that memory as you recall it. Yeah. So I felt like, you know, that was a whole, there's so many things going on in neuroscience, you can't keep track of them all. So when I came across that research, I said, uh, well, that's pretty interesting, but does it fundamentally change any way I think about information processing in the cortex? Um, it's a it's a weird tweak on the memory recall process. It could lead to false beliefs or false memories, um, but it really does it really change anything fundamentally? Does it is it is it? And I couldn't think of how it did in some sense. So I said, well, I'll just try to ignore it for now because it may not be that important. Um, for the general idea of how information is processed. Um, it's obviously important for biological brains, but it wasn't clear to me that like- But it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily recruit the same, exactly the exact same molecular machinery when you recall it, when you learn it the first time and when you, when you learn it the second time. So, uh, the, the second time might involve different proteins and uh, the memory might be storing from like an intermediate form to a more long-term form. And that's the long term is gene dependent, uh, gene activ activation dependent. The uh, short term and intermediate term can be either just protein that are inserted in the membrane, um, and the intermediate term is going to be more like production uh, of mRNA that are hanging around. Yeah, but I thought this this rewriting of the memory was happening all the time. It wasn't just the first or second time. I thought it was something that was they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the more you learn something, uh, it doesn't necessarily involve the exact same uh, um, machinery at the molecular level. So, well, let me ask you this, given what I just said a moment ago, I was trying to think like, okay, given the mechanisms we believe are happening in the cortex, the sensory motor learning, the different types of you know, voting, um, does it change any of that fundamentally from an information theory point of view? And I couldn't see how it did. Um, but if you're missing some of the elements that makes the memory go from an, an intermediate form to a long-term form in, in models, for example, then you're missing a critical element of how that memory is stored, right? Yeah, but but is it, again, forget the intermediate and the long-term form, just say, I've got this memory, how does the system work, right? How's it processing information? Uh, there's neurons that represent location, there's neurons that represent the sensory pattern, there, you know, does it change that? I mean, does it, you can separate out this sort of biological details of memory formation, and I'm, I'm not hearing from you that in this, the difference between media, you know, none of our theories really rely tremendously at all between short-term, mid-term, long-term memories. I mean, we, 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 we can model that, but the information flow doesn't really, doesn't depend on that too much. Uh, I don't know if, that, if that makes sense. Jeff, when, you, um, when you're talking about uh, the, uh, you don't want drift because the, uh, the voting would start to fail uh, is there a mechanism there that allows you to have a general, uh, to have, you know, one concept of whatever the you know, coffee cup is and generalize it? Is it a constant rewriting or reinforcing allows it to be less specific and more general? Is that a mechanism that's kind of built into your formulation? I don't know. I, I made a more general claim, Kevin. I was saying any associative memory, which exists everywhere, it's all over the place. You're trying to like a population cells, activates another population of cells. Any associative memory is in some sense relying on stable representations. So, so I'm just clarifying that's a broader claim than voting. It's 
coding is just a touch, you know, just one instance. Um, so could it lead to some form of generalization? I don't know. I'd have to, I, you have to work, you have to work, work it through and explain them how. Um, you know, just drifting on its own doesn't seem like a good way of generalizing. <laughs> no, no. I mean, if if it's if it if it's drifting by not being reintroduced to what the stimulus was, then that's not very helpful. But I'm I'm just trying to think of if if you're not referencing up to uh, a hierarchy for surprise, you I'm looking at if there's this intrinsic mechanism you have to explain how you're also able to generalize as well. And that's what I'm trying to grasp. Well, well the, yeah. If, if, if associative is so brittle in that sense, how no, can it's, you it's not do brittle. That? If associative memory is very, very robust to noise, it's, it, but it, it, it's brittle if you change everything. You know, it's like there's a difference. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. This is not noise. This is, you know, I'm, I'm getting more exemplars and yeah. I'd like to put them in the same class. Well, that's not what the, that's. I'm not sure that this paper on drift showed that, right? They were giving the same samples over and over and over again. Um, they weren't like new variations on the theme. Right. I, I wasn't so much referencing the papers per se as it kind of raised the question in my mind. Well, I don't know. Look, in general, I, the way I approach these things is like there's so many things going on in neuroscience, you have to, you have to be very selective and try, very, the challenge is to figure out which ones you can put aside for the moment, which ones you can't. And that's a really hard task. And that's like the hardest part of the whole thing. It's like, what are the key things we have to focus on? What are the ones we don't have to focus on? And so everything we do is, is going through that process. So I've, I know I've, I, the drift thing was new to me, but the, the, the rewriting of the memory idea, that was one that a few years ago, I said, gee, it doesn't seem to be, that seems like one we can put on the back burner here and not worry about it right now, along with a gazillion other things. Um, and I would generally put anything that's unique to the olfactory system, I would put in that category too. Uh, I would say, yeah, that's really different. It's a weirdo system. <laughs> so, well, so far, um, yeah. we don't know if it is though. But, but that you could argue about everything, right? We just don't know, but everything could be argued yep. like, you know, <laughs> like, you know, maybe the, 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 the you know, the, the, clusters of neurons in your spinal cord are really going to be essential for, you know, I don't know, understanding physics. <laughs> it seems unlikely. Um, so that's just the, that's just the way it is. But I mean, you, we can't, if, if we say everything has a possible, possible, yeah, but we have to make choices. Otherwise we'd just be, uh, we wouldn't make any progress at all. So I, I mean, I think this is true of, of theorists in any field. This is a general principle of theorists in any field is you have to decide what things you can ignore and what things you have to pay attention to. And that's where the skill resides, a lot of the skill. So anyway, I'm just giving my, I'm not saying I'm right about this. I'm just saying this is how I thought about those things. I can give you an example of a computational system that has almost 100% representational drift and still works just fine. What's that? Uh, that's your uh, computer. Uh, <laughs> you think about which memory locations contain a particular piece of knowledge in RAM, that changes constantly. Every time you start up a program, it'll be completely different physical places in memory that will be holding your- it's True. And, and when you save it back to disk, it'll be in a completely different it's place. True, but-, but we able keep, to operate on it and-, and Yeah, but but we never, we, yeah. we cause, because we keep track of where all the locations are. Everything- yeah, so Everything has to be relative. <laughs> everything is, that's because we- have, you know the relative locations of everything. Yeah, so well, that's, fine. the computer uses the content, I mean, it uses the address, addressable memory where brains don't, right? Yeah. And so brains have to do associative it's just a random comment, but okay, okay. It's a humorous comment, but I don't think it teaches us too much. <laughs>